Cineworld is a London listed cinema chain with cinemas in the US, UK and Eastern Europe. In December it announced a bid for a company called Cineplex, the main Canadian operator. This caught our attention as it comes after the launch of the recent film streaming offers from Apple and Disney etc. We were even more surprised to see the headlines that talked about revenue rising, expanding margins and an attractive dividend. However, the business reality is really very different and we think it's actually a horror show in the making. Before we go on, I must remind you that under Hong Kong SFC regulations, we can't make stock recommendations to the public and none of what follows should be taken as investment advice. We see that Cineworld's taken full advantage of the regal deal and the change in lease accounting to get extremely creative and this has flattered their growth, buried costs, inflated margins and obscured $2 billion of debt and liabilities from the balance sheet. The distortions are so beneficial Official that they're talking about de-gearing and being strongly cash generative, even though they're actually consuming cash and will have to borrow to fund the proposed dividend. All of which is bad news when the like-for-like -like revenue is falling and real leverage is now over nine times corrected EBITDA. The debt-funded bid for Cineplex will make a bad situation even worse as they'll be taking on six billion Canadian of liabilities to buy a company that's also got declining box office revenue and barely covers its cash costs. Putting the company through our governance, accounting and peer performance framework reveals the key issues. Governance. Cineworld is run by the grade dingers who own 28%. The board has 10 directors, but many of these are either family, long-term employees or have connections to the family. We suspect they're a fairly compliant bunch because the grey diggers are actually paid quite well and are allowed to bump up the family income with related party rental fees. They also benefit from an incentive scheme that's fairly simplistic, focusing as it does on EBITDA and EPS. This means it ignores the risk of leverage and the potential for value destruction. The scheme also looks fairly easy to gain because last year they were paid over 90% of their bonuses even though like for like EBITDA and EPS dropped. Accounting. Cineworld's accounting consumptions are even more important than normal because their debt far exceeds their tangible assets. The problem we have is that those assumptions they use seem a little bit odd. For example, they value their cash generating units assuming that admissions will rise when clearly in the real world their own admissions are falling. But the more interesting move is how they made such a large portion of their lease liabilities simply disappear. Earlier this year, everyone was required to bring leases on balance sheet but they were allowed to revalue the liability using a discount rate of their choice. Cineworld decided to use 8%, which seems a little bit odd because it's much higher than their borrowing costs and it's quite close to the capitalization rate they use on their gross rental yields. A high discount rate reduces the present value of the liability and so this choice, along with a few other adjustments, cut 2 billion US dollars from their reported liabilities. The problem is that cash lease payments are actually unchanged, so while the PL and balance sheet benefit from these changes, they understate the company's real cash flow and its liabilities. This is particularly important when Cine starts to talk about deleveraging, but is in reality simply swapping debt for a lease liability, leaving the shareholders no better off and certainly not reducing risk. They further obscure reality by talking about a debt to EBITDA ratio of 3.3 times, which we think is calculated in a naive and rather useless way. For the ratio to be useful, investors need to either use net debt corrected for the missing leases to EBITDA or use net debt without the leases but then deduct the lease payments from EBITDA. Either way, their leverage ratio rapidly rises to over nine times, far in excess of what most lenders would be happy with. Performance. Management says they've improved margins, but we see that most of this comes from a few accounting tricks and provisions taken at the time of the regal deal. They then top this up with further lease provisions, allowing them to declare a future profit improvement. However, the underlying business is actually getting worse. They go on to say they're strongly cash generative, which we think is an extremely generous interpretation of reality because reported operating cash flow only looks healthy thanks to the change in lease accounting and the collection of some related party receivables. Adjust for this care and maintenance costs and interest payments and it's quite clear that Cineworld is actually consuming cash and this is before the proposed dividend. No wonder they've used a few sale and leaseback deals to generate some cash. The Cineplex deal also looks a lot worse when examined closely. Cineplex's revenue growth is minimal and its cash flow barely covers its lease obligations and maintenance capex. 
Cineworld is already talking about some synergistic benefits of around 130 million US dollars, but we suspect that much of this will come from provisioning again. Bear in mind that if the new debt costs more than about 5%, most of this synergistic benefit will rapidly get consumed, simply servicing the debt. It's a very high risk deal that has the potential to bankrupt the company unless admissions rise rapidly or real margins expand far more than management expect. Under SFC rules, we can't in this video value the stock or make recommendations, but we can warn you that shareholders usually don't make much money when a company needs to be completely recapitalized. If you'd like to know more about our research or want to dig into some of the issues we've highlighted, please visit our website and look at the Cineworld page using the links below. There you can download some of their recent filings, which we've been through and highlighted some of the key areas. Alternatively, to keep up to date with our reviews, subscribe to our channel or send us an email. Before you go, please remember, none of this should be taken as investment advice. We've sourced our facts from the company documents, but the interpretation and the conclusions we've drawn are just our opinion. And of course, they are subjective and should not be used as the basis for an investment. Thank you very much for your time.